All right, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Danielle Fabrizio. I'm the supervisor in Valley's Department of Community Health and the coordinator for our Thrive program. Uh, if you'd like more information on Thrive, I will put a couple of links in our chat here today. Um, but to jump right in, Megan Coral is a social worker in nope. Valley's PD. Nope, I'm not a licensed marriage and family therapist. You just told me that too. <laughs> um, she also facilitates Valley's Triple P program. Um, we're so excited to be able to offer this lunchtime Q&A follow-up for everybody today. Um, the program is being recorded and we will email it out to anybody who registered for it um, in case you have to hop off early or you have a toddler screaming in the background and you missed an answer. Um, so we did receive quite a few questions. Um, so the plan is just to start with those. I'm gonna read Megan some questions. And then if there are more questions that come in when we're done with those, we will try to read those out um, as well and try to get to everything we can in the amount of time we have allotted. Good afternoon, um, everybody. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us. Um, all right, so we are gonna start with some name it to tame it questions. Okay. Um, any strategies to use when your child resists you naming it to tame it? For example, when I try to connect and name her feelings, when she is having a big emotion, she tells me to stop. So like Tina talked about when she did, um, you know, her whole brain is, is Tina's baby. But when children are having big emotions, sometimes they just need us to be there for them. Um, and we just need to be present for them. So we're just sitting there hugging them, offering it. There are plenty of times where my daughter will have a tantrum and she doesn't want to hug and I will sit near her. My body is like, I'm on the floor with her. My arms are open. So I'm available for a hug if she should need it, but I'm just there. And, you know, I won't like stare at her. I won't make eye contact with her, but she knows I'm there. And I will reiterate, I'm here for you. If you want to hug, I'm here for you. If you want me, um, Kids might not necessarily want us to always name what their feelings are. And what we think might be anger, what we think might be frustration, might be sadness. We don't, we don't know what's going on for, our, we don't always know what's going on for our kids. So if they're like, stop it, don't say that, they might not want you to talk to them. And that's okay. Because if you're sad, do you always want somebody to talk to you and tell you, oh, they see how sad you are? Not always. Sometimes it feels very nice, but even as adults, we don't always want somebody to tell us how we're feeling. Um, a next similar question, when my four-year-old son is upset at something and starts to cry, for example, it's bedtime and he doesn't want to go to school the next day and wants it to be the weekend, it seems like the more I soothe him or as soon as I validate him and say something like, I hear you and I know this is hard, buddy, um, he cries even louder and harder and agrees with me and continues to tantrum. It feels like he's never going to stop crying. I then have to tell him to please stop crying and we'll talk tomorrow and plan a fun weekend or something along those lines. Am I doing this wrong? Am I missing something? Okay, so you're on the right track. When your child is coming to you and they're upset and you're hugging them and you're holding them and you're like, I'm, I see how sad you are. I see how upset you are feeling. You hold them and they might cry a little bit louder until it comes down. Where you're getting caught up and we need a little bit of a shift is we need to have more patience because if the child then becomes expecting that you're going to shift and say, okay, well, that's enough now. Because we, we're not putting a time limit on how their feelings are. Being upset is not the same as being, having a tantrum, right? Tantrums are like throwing things and throwing our bodies on the floor. But if your child is hugging you and crying and crying a little bit louder, usually they get a little bit louder before it comes back down so that they're trying to get their feelings out. So it's a lot of being patient and waiting for the tantrum to be uh, not tantrum, waiting for the upset to come down without putting your own time limit on it. A lot of times these things can feel forever. And it's usually, if we, if we were to actually time it, it hasn't happened that long, right? So we're not putting a time limit on how sad we are or a time limit on how sad kids can be and for how long they can be. We're just there, we're present, right? So you're, you started off great where we need to shift a little bit as still be patient. And as hard as it is to be patient, we take our breaths, we check ourselves, make sure we're in a good way so that we can respond to our kids appropriately and effectively. So I hope that helps. So this next question seems to be consistent throughout, throughout a lot of the questions. Um, and it's, I always hear to ignore negative or bad behavior in this situation. 
Okay. So we, we the only behavior we ignore are things like pulling faces, sw um, swearing, kids are making noises that you don't particularly like, but they're not hurting anybody. Those are the things that we ignore. We don't ignore kids who are upset. We don't ignore, and we just, we don't ignore the other things. If they're throwing things, we don't ignore that, right? I'm, I'm going to keep you safe. I'm going to hold you or I'm gonna remove you from a situation where you're being unsafe, but I'm not going to ignore things that where you could potentially hurt yourself or things that are not just kids being silly. When we say ignore, we mean we, we don't want you to react to or punish for silly faces or you know, you, with swearing, you correct them once and then you let it go. You just ignore it. You give positive attention for the next positive thing that they do instead of harping on the negative things. So again, to go right in with that, um, always thought that to, when a child is tantruming and throwing themselves on the floor, we should ignore it and then acknowledge it after the fact. So a child is throwing themselves on the floor as long as they're not hurting themselves, right? Punching themselves in the head, um, in any sort of dangerous space, we're next to them. Not if, if they're going to start hitting us or hurting us, we, per, we hold their bodies. We, we're not harming them. We're just holding their bodies so that they cannot hurt themselves or us and we're being safe, but we're right next to them. And we're, you know, whether your child needs to have you rub their back or whether your child needs for you to be next to them in a hug or just nearby. Cause a lot of times what happens is kids will have, for lack of a better term, tantrum. They'll get upset. They'll get unhappy. They'll get dysregulated. And then we ignore them. So what happens when you ignore somebody who's dysregulated? They feel abandoned, they feel isolated, they feel alone, excuse me, and they don't know how to correct themselves. And a lot of times when kids are having these intense reactions, we're expecting them to know how to correct and re-regulate themselves. They don't know how to do it. Most adults don't know how to re-regulate themselves and don't do it appropriately anyway. So we can't expect little kids to know how to regulate themselves if we're not then gonna teach them. So we're there to help them we're there to, and we're not doing a lot of talking because they're not in a place where they can hear us. We're there to be next to them. We're there to, you know, connect, right? We, Tina talked about the right brain. We're there to connect physically with them if they should want it. And then when this is done, we talk to them about what they could do instead the next time they feel upset, they feel frustrated, they feel angry. The other thing that's really important as parents is to model how you yourself handle frustration, anger, upset. Don't give your children the most um, extreme of your problems, but it's perfectly fine to say to your child, you know, mommy was a little bit worried today at work. And so when I was worried, I took some deep breaths and I took a little walk and I felt better, or I was a little frustrated with somebody who wasn't very nice to me today. So what I did was I put on some music, but you're modeling coping skills for kids because they don't always have them right? They don't know them, but it's more effective for them to see their parents use the skills and see their parents implement them regularly so that they learn to use them. Plus, we don't always want to have like our the one child of ours who's constantly acting out and then it's, oh, well, this, this child is the problem. No, we have to, everybody needs to learn coping skills. Everybody needs to use coping skills. Everybody needs to apply skill, coping skills. So implementing them is, is what we need to do. Um, my son throws things once his little brother upsets him, and I don't know how to stop this. He throws things once his brother upsets him. Um, so with kids, we take the thing that they have thrown. We tell them they're not supposed to be doing. We do not throw things in our house. We take it away for anywhere from five to 30 minutes, and then we give it back to them. And we say, we talk to them about how they're going to use it appropriately. If they do it again, we take it away for longer. A lot of times kids need the opportunity to try again, right? They don't always know how to behave with things appropriately. So they need the opportunity to try again. Okay. Um, we have twin six-year-old boys. They have a difficult time transitioning from an activity to doing what we need them to do. For example, starting a bedtime routine. We repeat ourselves 10 times. They finally respond by screaming that they hear us. And then we're all frustrated. How do we help them transition and prevent this frustration on all sides? So transitional warnings are extremely helpful in these situations. Um, 
first, if you're going to implement anything that's new, you're talking to your child about what the new routine is going to be in advance. It can be, you know, as soon as dinner's done, hey guys, in about a half an hour or so, we're going to get ready for bed. And this is what we're going to do that's different. You know, mommy's going to put you to bed. We're going to read a story. You know, we're going to brush our teeth, whatever order you should put it in. It doesn't matter as long as you explain to your child what's going to happen. Transitional warnings are very helpful for kids. And depending on your child, you might want to start saying, hey, in 15 minutes, we're going to get upstairs and go to bed. Okay, now in 10 minutes, we're going to get upstairs and go to bed. In five minutes, we're going to go upstairs and get into bed. In two minutes, we're going to go upstairs and get into bed. One minute, we're going to get upstairs and go into bed. Okay, guys, time to go get upstairs and go into bed. So by this time, they've heard you say it so many times that they're going. And if they're not going, we give them a choice, right? Hey, guys, do you want to walk up the stairs? By yourselves or do you want me to hold your hand do you want to walk on your own do you want me to carry you it's not a matter of if they're going they're going it's just you can go on your own or i can help you so excuse me transitional warnings are very helpful i have two girls an eight-month-old and a three-year-old the three-year-old hasn't learned to deal with her anger and gets explosive throwing things when angry when we set limits and boundaries, she throws herself to the floor on her knees and doesn't care if she hurts herself. Any suggestions? So we're working with her when she's calm about how to use, you know, different skills to, to manage the anger, manage the frustration. And then in those moments, right, we're, we're hugging her, holding her, or putting some sort of physical contact on her to connect with her. And then we're addressing the, the situation later when she's calm, right? We're not talking, we're not talking to her when she's upset, but some kids don't there. It's more important for them to show you how they're feeling about it than it is for them to, you know, care about what's happening to their physical body. So we have to be there to teach them at a time when they can hear us. This is a perfect transition question. So my three-year-old tends to put all of her anger and frustration towards her little sister by hitting or pushing her. What can I do to steer her from physically hurting others around her and be able to let out her anger and frustration in a positive way? Right, so we went over the teaching already and we've talked about keeping their physical body safe. Um, sometimes we'll either remove the child or remove their sibling because we're not gonna let them hurt anybody, right? We don't hit and we don't hurt in this house. Um, I always say to my, like, the rules, one of the rules in our house is I don't hit you, you don't hit me. So making sure that there are rules in your house and that your child knows what they are is key. Um, and then secondly, we're removing children who, who are being unsafe. I'm not going to let you be unsafe. To specify which child would you remove? Would you remove the toddler who's hitting or the baby who was being hit? It depends on the situation. So in, in that particular situation, because it's a baby, I would remove the baby, right? Because I have to keep the baby safe. If kids are the same in age and we have one child who's like going after the other, then you remove the one who's being pursued rather than the pursuer. Um, if the child who is the one who's pursuing is then becoming so destructive and then taking things out on your house, you're removing them and keeping them safe. It's really about who needs to be kept safe. So that's, that's how I would remove them. Great. Um, okay. My daughter is one and has really bad separation anxiety from me. This makes it challenging to leave the room even. Most people can't take care of her except for my brother or husband, but whenever I'm around, they're not able to help wondering if there are any tips to make her mess her less attached to me. Yes. So it's okay. It's perfectly okay for your kids to be attached to you, right? We all go through different, they all go through different stages of separation anxiety. Um, one of the things that I find to be helpful is to let them know when you're going and that you're coming back and make kind of a big deal that you're back. Okay. I'm going to go to the bathroom. I'll be back in a few minutes. You stay right here. If they follow you, they follow you. Okay. And then when you're done, okay, I'm back. Let's play together. Hope you had a fun time, right? So you're wanting to establish trust with your child by telling them where you're going and when you're coming back. And it's, it's, most children don't understand time. So saying like, I'll be back in a few minutes or I'll be back in a short time is helpful to establish that like, I will leave, but I will come back because kids want to know that you're going to come back. And that's a lot of the reasons why they seek you out. Are you going to come back? 
And we want to emphasize that we are. Um, if you're somebody who like sneaks away from your children, right? oh, they're busy, they're playing. I'm going to just sneak out of the house and go somewhere. Um, don't do that. We want to be able to tell them I'm going here and I will be back because we're going to leave them at places like daycare or school where they're going to be away from us for extended periods of time, but they want to know that you're coming back and that you're going to show up. Okay. Um, my, my child relies on mommy to go to sleep. When we try to change that up either with daddy or by his himself, he goes into tantrum mode. What's the best way to advance this routine? So like we talked about with transitional warnings, telling the child who's going to be responsible for bedtime in advance is really helpful so that they have their feelings about it and they know what's coming. It's when we surprise them that most kids struggle. I mean, think about most, most adults don't like to be surprised, don't like to be flexible, don't like to have their experience suddenly changed, right? You walk into work and then, oh, actually, we need you to work from a different location today. You're not going to be particularly thrilled about it. Kids are the same but we expect them to be a lot more flexible with a lot less information. So telling them in advance is helpful. Um, talking about what's going to happen. Okay. So daddy's going to put you to bed. Daddy's going to read you a story. Daddy's going to brush your teeth. And then you're going to kiss mommy goodnight. And I'll, and I will see you in the morning. I love you. And that's how we move it forward. Okay. So there's quite a few food questions. I'm going to kind of put them all into, into a couple. Um, my toddler comes home from daycare and always asks for a cup of milk immediately. I'll give him the milk, then he won't eat dinner afterwards. Is he just full from the milk? Is this normal for his age? He has, he was always such a good eater as a baby and now is becoming much more picky. Okay. So aside from any feeding issues that children might have, when we make a big deal about food, then they learn, okay, this is something that I can control. This is something that I can use for your attention. So he's asking for the milk. That's great. But then when dinner comes, we're putting things on the table and we're not talking about it. We're not saying like, you have to eat this, or you, we're not bargaining with them. We're not talking to them about how much they have to eat. Children are intuitive, natural eaters. They know when they're hungry. They know when they're full. Again, feeding issues or any sort of um, other organic medical issues there might be aside. Most children are, or are intuitive eaters. And so it's when we start talking about it, when we start putting our own stuff and we all have stuff around food, our own stuff onto the food is when they start saying like, I don't like this, or I don't want this. Okay. These are not things that we always have to address. If a child says to you, I don't like this, or this smells bad. Okay. But when we make an issue out of it, when we start putting our focus on it, that's when we start to see issues with kids and their eating. We're not telling them how much they need to eat. If, if you sat down for dinner and someone told you, you need to eat this much of this and this much of that, you'd probably be very unhappy. I know I would, and I wouldn't be thrilled about that. My child will refuse dinner and immediately want snacks once dinner is over and cleaned up. Okay. What would you do in that case? So knowing that this is a pattern, we would say to them, whatever we're serving, this is what we're having for dinner. There aren't going to be any snacks after dinner. And then we stick with that. We reinforce that every day. If we're giving in to the snacks after we've already said there's no dinner, then your child learns that what you say is not going to be what's true. And so then they can just ask for snacks whenever they want. We have to be consistent, right? Children need immediate and consistent parenting and immediate and consistent responses from their parents. And by immediate, I don't mean like instantaneous. You have time to take a breath. You have time to take a you know, think about what you want to say, but pretty, pretty quickly after they've asked you something, then they need a response. My grandson is an extremely fussy eater and it's really hard to get him to eat or try new foods. Any suggestions? Put it on his plate. Everybody should have the same foods on their plate. We're not talking about it. And we just keep reintroducing it, but we're not talking about it. As soon as you start talking about it, the kid is not going to want to eat it because now it's a big deal. And now it becomes a power struggle. But if we just put, let's say the food is broccoli. If we put food on their plate with other foods and broccoli keeps making an appearance, eventually they might get curious about trying it, especially if other people are eating it. If other people are not eating this, but we're expecting kids to eat it, we're just not gonna have that. They're just not gonna do it. Oh, well, you're not eating it, so why should I? And they might not necessarily say that to you. Some of them might. Um, 
we have a newborn and our three-year-old's behavior has changed quite a bit. We are trying our best to comfort her and give her attention and or discipline when needed, but it's been quite difficult. Any advice? So kids naturally go through struggles when there's a new baby in the house or whenever there's any sort of transition. With school um, beginning and ending, they struggle with that with any sort of upsets to the family. So we can always try to prepare them in advance for what's coming to the best that we can. I mean, you're not telling them in the middle of February that we have to prepare for summer, but you're giving them like a day or two or a week or two notice when bigger things are coming. Um, special one-on-one -on -one time with your child is definitely helpful and it's going to take them time to adjust to a new kid because they're used to all of your attention and now, now they have to split it. So it's, it's hard for them. They have a hard time with it, but part of it is just adjustment. How do you handle one child for having constant jealous fits when the other child too, I'm sorry, it's having constant jealous fits about what the other two-year-old is doing or has? Well, we're trying to think about what might be the reason for the jealous fits, right? Are they angry that the other child has it? Are they not able to entertain themselves? And so they're looking at what the two-year-old is doing, trying to get kids and especially siblings to engage in cooperative play or do things together is really helpful. So getting them to work on something that requires them to be together, like an art project that requires them to both of their help or, you know, doing puzzles together. You're wanting to, to help them work together because a lot of times with siblings they see each other in opposition or as like enemies and so you're wanting to foster them working together and being together and some jealousy among siblings is natural right because then all this attention got taken away from me and went on to my sibling and then we're talking about sharing sharing is hard for a lot of kids they don't want they don't always necessarily want to be sharing and they have their feelings about you know, cooperating with younger siblings or wanting what other siblings have. So getting them to work together a little bit more collaboratively, it can be helpful with that. Okay. How do you work with storytelling with a child with OCD, especially with scary feelings and thoughts? I'm going to think that storytelling means like actual telling stories, not like lying. I think that um, this person was referring to the program last weekend when she was saying, um, oh, remember when we got into that car accident? I think that oh, was okay. an example she had. Okay. So when we're talking about, um, when they're talking about something traumatic that has happened or something that was deeply upsetting to somebody, we want to keep moving the story forward. So when we're dealing with, with any sort of trauma, we're telling the next step in it, right? So if we're dealing with a child who has anxiety or OCD, and even if they don't, we're still talking about what happens next. Okay, then what happened next? Right. So let's say in the situation with the car accident, you know, they all of a sudden felt this ram against the car. They heard a loud noise and then they were really scared and they started crying. But then the police came and then somebody came to pick them up and then they, they were home and felt you know, much more safe and much more comfortable. We're wanting to tell the next part of the story because that helps kids get stuck get gets helps kids get unstuck from whatever the situation might be it's when they get as kids with ocd or anxiety will get stuck on the part where the car accident happened right so the car accident happened and that was really scary and then the police came and then somebody came to get us and then we got home and then we were safe and then and then and then and then until we're at the present point the more we talk about it and move through that story, the less it likely it is to get stuck because the child is trying to figure out why did this happen, right? A lot of times when kids are trying to make sense of their world, they don't understand why things happen. So they assume it's because of them or because of the world around them. It's an internal locus of control, external locus of control. So they get stuck on why did this happen and how can I prevent this from happening? Car accidents happen. We can't, there's nothing that the child could do to stop it. So we have to move them forward in that way, right? And so tell the next part and tell the next part and tell the next part. And this question is another one that is from our, our program um, last weekend. At what age does the wiring between the hemispheres stop? 
Uh, so wiring between the hemispheres stops at 25. However, our brains can continue changing until pretty much we're dead. Um, we know this from traumatic brain injury and people compensate in very different ways if they have any sort of traumatic brain injury, but we can, we have the ability to learn new things pretty much until we die. Okay. Um, a couple questions came in. What do you do if your child keeps asking repetitive questions after you've already answered, but it's not what they want to hear? Do you ignore and stop answering or say I answered that already? It feels like my son never stops when I ignore him. Okay, so your child is asking repetitive questions. They want the answer. You've already answered it calmly, right? We answer it calmly. We might say, okay, I already answered it and this is what it is. We're trying to stay calm as much as we can. And at a certain point, I will go asked and answered, but I'm still calm about it. It's when they're trying to get a reaction from you more likely than they want the answer to the question, especially if it's, you know, I, can I have a snack? Can I have a snack? Can I have a snack? No, 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 no. They're just asking to try to get you to change your mind. And sometimes if we've gotten, if they've pushed us to our breaking points, we go, oh, fine, just have it. That's when they learn, okay, I just have to keep asking more. So we want to be consistent with our responses, especially when we're saying no. My four-year-old child gets angry and while processing emotions says bad, bad words like stupid, dumb, et cetera. Should I let her or correct those behaviors? I mean, it really depends on your personal feelings about those words. Um, if there, she's calling herself stupid, dumb, then we might want to correct that, right? You're not stupid, you're not dumb, but she's not in a place where you can hear that. Excuse me, she's not a place where she can hear that at the time when she's angry. If she's calling the situation stupid and dumb, fine. But if she's calling herself stupid and dumb, then we would want to address that later. Okay. Um, what is the best way to handle bedtime with a toddler who wants to stay with you until they, who wants you to stay with them until you, until they fall asleep? Um, best way that to handle, okay. Well, you're putting them to bed, right? We're telling them in advance what's going to happen when we're going to go to bed. And it really depends on what you feel like you can do. There are plenty of parents who feel like I can't, I don't want to hear my kid cry at that time. I just, I don't want to. Um, so you have to decide what is best for you and what you're going to be able to stick to and then be consistent with it. So if you're saying uh, you have to go to bed in your own bed at this time, then you're preparing them in advance, right? This is what's going to happen. And then we have to be consistent with it. If you're saying, I just can't bear to hear them cry, then that's, that would be a different situation, right? Where you're, you're focusing on calming them down to the best that you can, then putting them to bed and hoping to go to fall asleep. If you're wanting to break them of the habit of staying with you until they fall asleep, then we're telling them in advance, I am going to stay with you till, you know, we're going to read a story. And then when the story is done, then I'm going to leave. Then we have to be consistent with that. Whatever we tell them, we have to be consistent with that because if we don't, then they learn that what we say doesn't really matter. And then they, then they know, all right, well, if I cry, then it's, I'm going to come back to you. And it's a hard situation because if your child is, this doesn't want this, they don't want you to leave. They may start crying and then you're going to feel tempted to go back and cuddle them until they stay fall asleep. There are other people have done um, different reward systems and saying like, okay, if you're able to stay in your bed tonight and you can go to sleep on your own, you can get a star or a sticker, or they'll provide, you know, here's your stuffed animal, here's your blanket. They're going to be with you. Sometimes like one of your, um, like a pajama shirt that you might've slept in so that your child has like your smell with them is helpful for kids that are, that have trouble going about on their own. Those things can be helpful. Great. Um, what do you think about telling a child to be careful? It seems like a popular thing to be told not to say. Um, you're telling them what to be careful of instead of just a global be careful because kids don't know what that necessarily means. So if we're saying, keep your hands on the rail, 
walk, you know, pay attention while you're walking up the stairs or um, watch where you're walking. Those are more specific instructions than be careful. Because I, I think when with little kids, especially, we're constantly like, be careful, be careful, be careful. But we don't know, they don't know what you're talking about. They don't know necessarily what that means. So we want to be more specific about what we're referring to. What are your thoughts on always making children share? I have seen people say children should not always have to share their toys. That is depends on the, on the person, on the family. Um, I've seen parents go, well, they have to, they have to learn to share compared to let them give it up when they're ready to give it up. I personally think it's helpful if you're going to encourage them to share then we encourage the other person to share back so that the kid, so that the child learns that they're going to get it back if we're, if we're going that route. I mean, it's, it's hard because sharing is a very pro-social behavior and we want our kids to be able to get along with others in the world. And so they have to learn to give up toys when other people want to play with them, but also they can take their time. You can offer options of, okay, you may not be ready to play, to give this up just yet, but are you going to, do you think we can give this to, you know, so-and-so in a minute or two? Okay, that minute is up, you know, obviously fast forward your time. Minute is up, let's give that to so-and-so. Okay. I like this question because it starts with Megan is so smart. Her responses are so helpful <laughs> and I agree. Thank you, that's very <laughs> sweet. How can I get my child to be more social? He tends to play alone, gets overwhelmed in large groups and doesn't like when kids take his toy. He doesn't have siblings yet. I want, I want him to enjoy social interactions more. Okay, so some kids totally get social interactions. They just do. They're like, they observe others and they totally get it. And other kids don't get it. They just don't understand how to approach others or they might be nervous to approach others or they just truly don't understand how social interactions work. And so in that case, we're, we can practice with them we can talk to them about like, do they actually wanna even approach other kids? And there's plenty of times where we can, you know, we wanna encourage them that they can be independent and do things on their own or they can play with others. So sometimes it's practicing with them, teaching them, um, here's how you would go about going up to a group of kids at the playground. Hi, I'm so-and-so, would you like to play? And some kids need that very structured, very explicit, this is how this goes um, as far as social dynamics goes and social rules goes. So that can be, that can be helpful. It's definitely something to try. Great. Um, are there any more questions? That was a ton of questions just fired at you, Megan. <laughs> any more that, that, that uh, are gonna come in, send them now in our Q and A. Uh, while we wait, I did throw two links in the chat before. Um, one was for our Thrive membership, so you can get updates on programs like this. One was um, for our Facebook group. Otherwise, it sounds like we've answered every single question <laughs> ever in the books, <laughs> ever, ever. This is it, people. A ask your questions now, right? All right. Well, again, this was recorded. Megan, that was fantastic. That was a lot of information. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was my pleasure. All right. And we hope to... See you all soon at future Thrive events um, and hope to support you guys as best we can. Have a great almost weekend. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Bye.